good afternoon shall we start the this last part of this uh, lecture series today we look at the concept of curl its physical significance geometrical meaning and applications we have been looking at three important aspects of vector calculus the gradient the divergence and curl today we had mathematical definition physical concept geometrical understanding and examples for applications in various branches let us recapitulate an important point we learned yesterday this is about flux flux as well as divergence describe the same physical situation basically the outflow the extent of the outflow or inflow of some quantity to define a flux we need a vector and an area we went ahead and then we defined divergence and highlighted the difference between flux and divergence to repeat flux is a scalar quantity and divergence is a function flux is defined only with respect to an area whereas divergence is defined at every point in any region and we have also seen how how these are related why i am repeating this is today we need a similar today we do a very similar thing we start with a scalar quantity and then arrive at a vector quantity a function which can describe the situation better let us proceed we start with the concept of circulation circulation and curl are related they basically describe the extent to which some sense of rotation exists in a vector field let us start with circulation the concept of circulation just as we needed a vector and a surface for flux here we need a vector and a closed path to define the circulation the vector is a here dl stands for the elemental length vector along the path and this integral the circle on the integral shows it's a closed path c is a closed curve it need not be circular it can be any closed path so this is how the curl is defined we need a vector and a closed path to define curl in this form which i have mentioned here let us look at the details here we are talking about a closed path soon we will be talking about a surface also consider an open surface s this the surface of the balloon is an here it is an open surface is not completely closed this part of the net marked s it can be related as uh, regarded as a surface now there is a curve here the white circle is a curve c i have marked here then there is a curve c here also the basic question in whatever we are going to do today is what is the connection between this surface and this circle the curve and the surface we keep talking about a curve and a surface in this case we have taken the balloon surface as a surface s and this white circle as the curve, the curve obviously you can see there is a close relation between this and this this is a curve that encloses the surface but on the other hand this relation is not unique you could inflate or deflate the balloon to different extent and you have different surfaces a large number of surfaces can be thought of for all of which this circle remains the same similarly you could distort the shape of this surface but this curve rem remains the same that is just to give an idea that this relation is not unique what is important here is to understand the relation between the curve and the surface which we'll be talking about throughout this lecture now the circulation depends on the vector field and all the points on the curve circulation is defined can be defined with respect to this curve so there is a vector field at every point there is a vector then we call there is a vector field 
and we evaluate it over this circle. So, it is not defined at a point, the circulation is not defined at any fixed point, but we need a curve, only with respect to a curve we can define it. How do we calculate circulation? You can see here, it is a dot product. The dot product of the vector and the line element along the curve, the DL. It is the DL which makes up the C. For example, if C is a circle, it need not always be, then DL is a small arc of the circle. Okay. And what do we do? At every point, small point DL, we do this A dot DL, vector dot, dot product. We take the dot product and we get a scalar, of course, it is a scalar quantity and then add it up or if it is infinite num number of infinitesimal small DLs, we take, integ we integrate it. This is called integrating over the curve and then we get a circulation of the vector for that curve. Now, we are going to do a thought experiment. Consider a surface. Throughout the lecture, I will be talking to, uh, talking, asking you to consider a surface and it is a curve which encloses the surface. So, C and S, that is the notation I have given throughout. So, shrink the curve and finally bring the curve to 0. And when you do that, this, curve, the, this becomes 0, but the ratio of the area of the surface to the curve remains finite. Okay. So, this ratio is called the curl and it is a local quantity defined at every point. This is something very similar to what we did for flux and divergence. Flux was defined for a surface and in the limit we shrank the surface and went to a point and then we divide, defined divergence. That is the relation between flux and divergence. Here the relation is between curl, circulation and curl. We consider circulation over a curve and shrink the curve till we could come to the limit. And geometrically, it tells you to what extent a vector curls around a point. This will be clear when we look at the examples later. Let us write down mathematically this concept. What exactly we mean by, mean by this? So, we can define the curl in terms of its projection. Curl is a vector quantity. So, we talk about the projection in, in any direction. Okay. This direction is defined with respect to the circle and the uh, with respect to the surface and the curve, not necessarily circle. Okay. Consider the small element and then consider the area vector there. Of the small area delta s, whatever is the area vector for that. We defined the area vector in the last class, the outward drawn normal. So, that is the direction of n. In that direction, the component of curl along n is defined as a limit as the area tends to 0, literally we are actually shrinking the surface, shrinking the curve also. So, this ratio does not become indeterminate. In the limit, it has got some finite value and that is treated as the component of curl along that. So, how will you construct the curl vector? You get the component along x, y, z and then you can construct the curl vector out of it. We shall do that shortly. What is to be remembered here is the direction of the unit vector is normal to the area s bounded by the curve at every point, at every point for every delta s. And it is defined as a limiting circulation. So, we will call curl as a limiting circulation just as we call divergence the limiting flux. Now, the physical meaning, consider a wheel of this kind which is kept in a flow, flowing water. When water flows the way shown here, if the water flows in this direction, along this direction, then it will rotate like this. If it flows in the other direction, it will rotate in the opposite direction. If the water does not flow, there is no net rotation either. So, how do you measure? For example, in a velocity field, velocity is a vector you can define a velocity field. In a velocity field of the velocity made up of that field is made up of the velocity of every point in a, for example, in a river, you could uh, take this wheel and keep it, it is a, should be a very small wheel and keep the, uh, see it such that the center coincides with the point where you want to measure. 
and then see whether it rotates. If it rotates, yes, there is circulation at that point. Remember, it is on every point, we can only define it at a particular point. So, this is the method, gross method to check circulation. Go around with a wheel, put it in the velocity field and this works for water, water uh, velocity vector field, but not for other vector fields for example. Why do I say it should be a very small wheel? Because remember we are talking about the limiting circulation. So, literally we are talking about the circulation at that point. At that point there is no circulation as such. Circulation is over a path. But in the limit we can shrink the path imaginary, we can imagine that the path is shrunk and then define a circulation. So, that is why I say it should be a small rather uh, small uh, wheel of small diameter. This is one way of uh, looking at curl, the geometrical meaning of curl. If curl is 0, so there can be regions in a field where curl is 0 or non-zero, we will see examples. Then it is called irrotational at that point irrotational, no rotation, it means no rotation. Now we go to the grand master of physics, Richard Feynman. He has given a very nice visualization for students. How do you visualize curl in any, you can carry this analogy, it is an analogy, you can carry this analogy to any field. Listen carefully, what Feynman talks about curl. If you want to measure curl in a velocity field, for example, to get a concrete idea, let us consider the velocity of water molecules, a river, a flow in a river, water is flowing through a river. You keep a wheel in this fashion, uh, sorry, you do not keep a wheel, you consider a tube. For convenience, let us consider a tire like thing, a tube. That tube is kept in, in the water, in the flow. And this tube is a very peculiar tube. This tube is an imaginary virtual tube, there is no real tube. So, water is flowing through the tube. Is it difficult to imagine? Can you imagine that? First imagine a tire, a big, uh, just what we want is a tube. It need not be even circular, but let us take a tire. And now make it an imaginary tire, there is no tire really, you only have drawn a picture of the tire. So, water flows through that, there is no material there. So, water flows through that. So, you can only imagine a, water is running, it is not affecting the water flow anyway. That is what Feynman says and then he says to measure the curl at a point, you keep this device in such a way that the center coincides with the point you want to measure the curl and then freeze all the water everywhere except inside the tire, okay and then check whether the water is moving or not. If it is not moving, there is no curl. The water can move only along the circle. If it moves, there is curl. This is what Feynman has said. It is a bit tough to remember. So, I will repeat this point. Feynman says, we can visualize it easily in the case of a water flow. Consider an imaginary tube, three dimensional imaginary tube, close the tube of course. Keep the tube in the water flow, such a way that the center of the tube, the geometric center of the tube coincides with the the point which you want to measure the curl, okay. Water is flowing through the tube, it is an imaginary tube. Now, we freeze all the water everywhere except that which is trapped inside. It is a freeze and at that instant is the water flowing. If the water is flowing, it has to flow only through the tire. If it does, then there is curl. If the water does not flow, there is no curl. That is his way of uh, understanding the physical con or geometrical concept rather, okay. Now, we will go to the details, my uh, other details. This definition we should always remember. So, I will keep it in a few more slides so that you are very familiar with this. This is uh, again the concept of limiting circulation. Curl is, curl and same uh, circulation are similar, but circulation can be defined only for a path and curl can be defined at every point. So, that is the definition of, that is what is written here also. Let us look at some points, some important aspects of curl. First point, curl is a vector field. If you go back, gradient was a vector field, divergence was a divergence was a scalar field, not a vector field. And curl is a vector field, which means at every x, y, z, 
you can define a vector, a curl vector at every x, y, z. It can be different or same at different points, that doesn't matter. It represents the net circulation around that point. When I say around that point, qualitatively, what I mean quantitatively is this around, I construct a small part around the point and then shrink it in the limit. That is what I say by around the point because there is no meaning in telling at that point. Circulation around the point in the limit is the curl at the point, that is the way you look at it. Curl has a magnitude and a direction, it is a vector quantity. First let us talk about the direction. The direction is normal to the surface, the direction is normal to the surface upon which the circulation is greatest. All that you get from the definition. So, you go with a tube, imaginary Feynman tube, you go with the tube, you keep it in different planes, the tube can be kept in different planes in the flow and see where you have to keep so that there is maximum circulation. Then that surface will point in a direction, we have defined the directional directed area. So, that direction will be the direction of the curl. What about the magnitude? Magnitude of the curl represents the maximum circulation at any point. These are related, let us relate these two together. You have a water flow situation, you go with the Feynman's uh, imaginary tube. First thing to realize is that the magnitude of the flow inside the tube is going to depend upon how you are going to keep the tube. At any point, you could keep the tire in different orientations, right? With respect to the flow, for example. So, in different orientations, you will have different amount of water going through it. In one orientation, you will see the maximum amount of curl exists and that orientation gives the direction perpendicular to that surface is the direction of the curl and the magnitude is whatever value is there in that direction when you correspond to that direction. That is how we define the magnitude and direction of the curl. You can look at the lecture material again and uh, read it again, then you will fully understand it. Of course, we will also define it in other ways so that it is very, you are very thorough with it. This is the another way of looking at the direction. If you did not like the earlier example or if you find it is a bit confusing, let us look at this example. This is taken from a book called Grade uh, Divergence in Curl and all that. So, again, I keep talking about an area S surrounded by, bound by, the technical word is bound, bound by a curve. When I say area, bound by a curve, this is what I mean, there is this relation between the curve and the area. The only thing is area can be different, not unique, this is in a plane it is fine, but the area can be in 3D like a balloon. Now, if you keep the enclosed area always to the left and walk, you are supposed to walk around in the path in C. You could be walking around like this or like that. Depending upon how you walk, you can define. For example, if you keep the enclosed area always to the left and then walk like that, then the direction is defined as up. That is how you define the direction involved in this. It is equivalent to the famous right hand rule, which you use in the electricity and all that. So, that is another way to understand the direction of the curve. Now, let us look to a simple sum. It is very simple, I mean a simple problem, let us see. The problem is to actually calculate the circulation and curl for a simple geometry. What is a simple geometry? We have a loop in the xy plane of length delta x delta y, rectangular loop and we are going to travel along the red arrow, direction of the red arrow. And as we travel, we calculate the f dot, uh, sorry, we, uh, cal yeah, we calculate the f dot dx, f dot dl and calculate and sum it up, that is what we are going to do. Why do we do that? Because we want to find the curl. So, let us go step by step. First the xy plane, is, everything is in the xy plane, first take this one. So, what is the value of the, this is the point x naught, y naught, z naught. So, ahead, uh, so uh, th there will be a x at x naught, y naught minus z y by 2, a little bit this side, this side and then plus z y by 2 here two values will be there, okay? And subtract it, 
that will be for the delta x that is how you calculate these are all small distances remember that is why we can write like this why this delta y by 2 because a x is not the same everywhere in general a x a y a z everything depends upon x y z so a x little below and little above are different okay and then into delta x then a y into delta y that is how we calculate so the, we keep calculate what are we calculating a dot d l we calculate that like this what do we get if we do that so we have to do four times one two three four then only it will be complete that is what is written here four times are there each time so first time is this one second time is this one i have written the second time as this rs the third one is this one and this is down that is why how do we know that see here first one is positive that next is negative the first time corresponds to this that is taken as in the positive direction x direction the second time is negative this is in this direction the third time is positive this contribution and the fourth one is this contribution and here this is the one so here and here the point uh, uh, the value of f how do you calculate it value here into distance the value here and the value here are different why are they different because the vector has an ax uh, here ax x not y not minus delta y by 2 and here ax uh, uh, x not y not plus delta y by 2 this is the origin so here it is plus and minus the values of a value of x is different ax is different ax and then this minus this similarly this minus this so i have put everything together for convenience i have put the delta x terms together the delta y terms together now what do we get so what we get is this this is nothing but d a x by d y into delta y right the change in delta y okay and this is d a y by d x into delta x delta y now curl a dot e z is defined as 1 by d x d y of this integral who defined it like that we defined it earlier we have everywhere written everywhere this one okay the limiting case where there is a delta s in the denominator and this one in the numerator so that is what we are going to do remember in this case delta s is delta x delta y so we wrote this so which means in this case curl dot e z the z component of curl is the z component of curl is minus d a by d a x by d y plus d a by d x that is what we get out of it. So, what will we do next? We will try to do this in the other planes. This is only in the xy plane. And by this analysis in the xy plane gave us the z component of curl. But curl is a vector and we need the other components also. So, what do we do? You can take your pen and start writing the other components in the other two directions. Similar treatment, exactly similar treatment. If you do that, correctly you will get this so the picture is this the three differently colored loops are in three different planes and i consider in all these three planes then we will have why do i do these planes because i want to get the ez component the z component the x component and the y component why do i want to get three components because it is a vector quantity what is a vector quantity curl is a vector quantity Okay, I want to get the curl, this is a vector quantity. So, I find it convenient to get the x component, y component and z component by repeating the above calculation in three different. When I complete the calculation, this is what I get. I put up all the three components, I got three components here. If the three components are Vx, Vy, Vz, what is the vector? Vx, Ex plus Vy, Ey plus v z e z that is what I have written here from the components I generate the full vector. So, I get an expression for curl I can now calculate the curl I hope it is clear enough otherwise this is there in any elementary textbook on uh, which deals with curl and vector analysis and you will see this derivation with all its glory. So, you can refer to that but I hope it will be clear to you logically. Okay, we got an expression. Is this expression simple or complicated? 
some of you will find this is a very nice expression easy to remember but some of you will feel that it is not that easy to remember so what do we do let us try to find an easier way of doing this we will do that later so this is the basic direction i am not going to write this in every slide once you transfer it into your this computer then i will stop writing this it's a repetition basically so we just make an observation that if curl happens to be zero if you calculate all that and get zero then it is called an irrotational situation the curl at that point is zero and if it is zero everywhere it is called an irrotational vector field now immediately we come to a physics example conservative force fields are irrotational examples for conservative force fields are electrostatic and gravitational that should remind you of something which i said in the first class about conservative force fields what did i say i said for conservative force fields you can define a potential scalar potential and write the gradient the force as the gradient of the negative gradient of the vector of the scalar to repeat in the case of a conservative force field you can define a scalar potential and write the gradient vector then you will see that the force the vector that represents the force is a negative gradient of the potential that can be done in electrostatic and gravitational field that cannot be done in a magnetic field viscosity and friction and things like that that is a difference between conservative and irrotational so now you have got two characters in uh, to answer one of the questions i said on the first day we will talk more about conservative fields number 1 for conservative force fields you can write a gradient uh, you can write the force as a negative gradient of the potential number 2 for a conservative force field the curl is zero how are these two related yes you can do as homework prove the relation between the two statements one force can be written as a negative gradient of a scalar and two the curl in fact we will be proving it later just keep in mind we will catch it when we prove it we will prove it a bit later the criterion that a force field is conservative is that the path integral over a closed loop is zero equivalently the curl is zero at that point that's what we just said we come back to calculation of the curl what did we do we did did an exp, uh, we did a calculation we did this we looked at uh, this loop then we looked at such loops in all the three directions then we got three components of the curl we put them together come back to that so this is what we got curl is this quantity and i asked you whether it is simple or difficult i think if i ask for a show of hands half the people will say it is easy and half the people will say difficult so we will proceed with another way of looking at it you know about determinants you can see quickly that this is equivalent to this so those who like to remember it like this remember it like that those who don't like this expression can write this expression this may be easier to remember and i have introduced another way of writing curl a so far i have been writing curl a curl a is equivalent to del cross v this is equal to this curl a is equal sorry v same vector i have put v vector here a vector here okay so it i mean the same vector curl of a vector can be written in this way and it also can be written as del cross a it should be the same vector whether you remember this or you remember this you must remember this the curl is not a determinant the curl is a vector with three components curl is not a determinant then what is a determinant this is only trick it's only trick to remember oh sorry i have written something wrongly here a way to remember is what i meant this is just a trick remember this is not exactly the curl the curl is this so it's up to you to remember this way or this way you will be getting the answer correctly now it is time to go back and look at what we have been doing because the same operator del has appeared here 
I just now said this is curl. So curl appears, the gradient, the, the del operator appears again. So it is time to put everything together in one unit so that there is absolutely no confusion. So we will be repeating the formula in the last class. The del operator is this, this symbol is the del operator, this one. The del operator is a vector operator. It operates on something and gives you something. Let us see how it, how, what does it do to physical quantities. The operator has a form like this. If it is del of psi, it will be d psi by dx, d psi by dy, d psi by dz. Sorry, this is just del operator. I mean, this uh, partial derivative, not this z is not there. So that is the form for the del operator. Okay. Now, when it operates of on a scalar f, you get the gradient. That is what we saw in the first lecture. The gradient is written like this. So, see how it operates and gives you something? It operates on f and gives you this, a vector. That was what we discussed in the first class. In the second class, we discussed this. When we take the dot product of this vector with some other vector f, capital F here, it is a vector that dot product will give you the divergence which is a scalar quantity. Gradient is a vector function and divergence is a scalar function, not only scalar quantity but also a function, it is a scalar and that has a form like this. What I want you to look at is how the del appears in all this, how the del operates on this, how the del appears in a dot product with a vector how it operates on a scalar and you get physically different things, gradient and divergence. What else can you do with this vector, del, we wrote del, we wrote uh, del operating on a scalar, we wrote the, this vector as a dot product, in a dot product with another vector, what is remaining? We can write it as a cross product. So let us write the cross product of these two vector, the this vector and another vector, del vector and another vector that will give you curl. The cross product of the del operator with some vector f will give you curl which is a vector quantity, which is a vector function, actually it is a vector function, not only vector quantity but also vector function. So this puts everything together, the mathematical form and the common thing between all the three lectures, all the three concepts is the del operator. It offers a very convenient way of writing equations which happen across in all branches of engineering. As I said in the first class, thermal engineering, electrical engineering, diffusion, etc. Always, all these things. So you should know this operator, its form and how it behaves to know well all these things. What will be the expression? I have written the expression for the del operator, the gradient, the divergence and the curl expression is this, what we wrote here. This is the dot or the cross product, the cross product between this del operator, del vector and any vector. This will be the three directions, partial derivative x, y, z and then the vector components. This is the form of the curl operator. So we will write either curl A or del cross A. In both forms we can write. Now we are ready to move on. Remembering that this is only a convenient way. Let us do a very, a very nice thing, very interesting question. We will look at a very interesting question. This is the del operator and this is what the gradient of a scalar which we looked at. I would like you to calculate using whatever we learned the cross product of these two vectors. I have written two vectors, one is an operator, vector operator and another is a vector, gradient vector. I want you to take the cross product of this. How will you take the cross product? Using this formula, using this formula or this formula whichever. This is the same as this actually. Those who have a mathematical insight will quickly see that these two are the same. It is not actually too tough to see the result. I have written the vectors explicitly. This is the cross product. We want to take a cross product or we want to find the curl of a vector which is a gradient. 
So we want to find the curl of a gradient. This is how we find the curl of any vector and this is the gradient vector. The vector happens to be the gradient vector. So which is much order you can see that it can be written like this. That is what I asked you to do. I am just giving time for you to complete the calculation. I hope some of you have got the answer. The curl of a gradient is 0. That is a very important result, very useful result. And at this stage, I would like to you to note down a homework. I made two statements about the conservative field. First, that it can be written as a gradient of a scalar function and second, that the curl is 0. Connect that using this. That is what we have done here. So I have actually given the answer, not, not much of a homework. The homework is to understand what is going on. Let us look at some more details of this business. The curl is defined by our usual definition. The component of curl is defined like this. So we look at the relation between C and S. C is a curve, S is the area. So C is a curve which goes around an area and the area of this is D. This can be three dimensional and the area is a shaded, uh, the shade may not be visible but the shaded area here. Then this is the length element ds, I tra travel along this direction. The force field is in this direction. The force field can be in some direction and you can put the surface in any direction in the force field. If you put in this way, at this point the vectors will look like this. At another point the vectors will look different. Now the point here is you can imagine that this is made up of two surfaces. Then you have two curves C1, C2. I split it into two curves C1, C2. Then what do you notice here? Okay, you keep calculating the f dot d a dot uh, what did I write a dot dl. You keep calculating the a dot dl. Uh, in this figure, it is f dot ds, and you see that whatever happens here gets cancelled by whatever happens there in the neighboring part along this path. So what we have, we are left with only that. Now we can extend this, convert uh, the cover, they split this into an infinite number of loops, neighboring touching loops, infinite number of them. And for each one, consider any one of them. For that, this is the loop. And then you take the area vector for that. The area is looking here, the outward drawn normal. If it is this area, it will be looking in some other direction. If it is this area, it will be looking up. So depending upon that, you can calculate for each one of them separately. And then let us sum it up. Okay. Is it clear? Should I repeat? We have a curve and a surface. We split the surface into different parts and do this a dot dl or f dot ds in this picture. And then we see that along such lines where the neighboring uh, paths, the, this cancel, the result the effect cancels because it, f is in two different direction. Why is it cancelling? f dot dl. dl is along this and f is in the other direction. So just uh, get this cancelled. Yeah, the other way, sorry, f is constant, the dl is in the opposite direction. f is the field which is there, you are keeping the surface in the field. Let us sum it up for all the delta ci, sum is over all this. So we take an integration because they are all small quantities. And then what we get is this. This, if you want to know my more detailed version of this, you go to this excellent book, Berkeley Physics Course, all the books are excellent, there are very few books in that series. This is from the book called Electricity and Magnetism, volume 2 of Berkeley series. That has its picture and details on it. The result is this. And that is called the Stokes theorem. The result is written here. A dot dl for the curve is equal to curl A dot ds over the surface. That requires a very close examination. We are equating two integrals. One is a single integral, it is a circulation and the other one, this is just a circulation, we have been talking about it all the time. This is a surface integral, 
S is the surface. Yesterday I have used the letter A, but whichever letter you use, it's what we mean here is the surface. And this is the curl vector. The bracket R in the bracket shows it's a function of position x, y, z, the R vector. 